call this meeting to order as I as usually every reorganization I start the meeting and go right into board reorganization. But I'm going to make a suggestion to all of you tonight as a board and you can decide whether to go with it or not. It's your decision as a board to make. Um, as the Middlesex election is not certified yet, it appears that Charlie Merriam's the winner <coughs> of that and uh, there may be a recount um, of that happening. And I talked with the Secretary of State today to Will Senning, not the Secretary, but Will Senning is head of elections, and talked to the SBA, which wouldn't give us an opinion on this. They asked us to consult our own attorney. I've been trying to get an opinion out of the attorney for the past <laughs> three or four hours. I cannot get anyone to call me back right now. So my suggestion to you is that you elect a temporary chair for tonight to run your meeting, that you table all the organization until Charlie uh, is seated, is certified through that election process, and that you come back to all that, uh, and that we usually use the third Wednesday as a secondary meeting, so that you get plenty of time for the election to be certified, and then you come back to the reorganization at that point. Um, but someone would need to move, and then appoint Kari as the vice chair from Last time, it's up to you if you want them or not. I mean, but just someone to run the meetings. I don't, <laughs> this meeting. I don't feel this comfortable doing, doing that. that for you. I've always, you know, since I've been here, and what I was told when I came in seven years ago was traditionally the superintendent started the reorganization and then got out of after there was a chair. So that's my suggestion to you is that you table all the reorganization until the middle sex election is certified. Yeah, um, I like the idea. I, I just have one question. Yep. Does that allow us to do business? It allows you to do business. I think, I, like I said, I, I'm giving you what I can best determine from Will and conversations with Will Senning, mm -hmm. but there, the secretary, when he talks about elections, it's usually advice. It, he always, at the end, will say, consult your own attorney. Mm -hmm. I was open with you that I haven't been able to do that. Yeah. So I'm and, and even when you do, it's not always they're kind of sphinx-like. Oh, they, yeah, it's all over the place. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's a good way of, of putting it. But I would say that you just hold all that. Um, there is a certain time that, and Will said it to me. He said, "We're in a gray area, folks." Yeah. <laughs> so there is no. So my best suggestion in in all of that is just table it until. <clears throat> Charlie is certified, and you can, he can be part of the process for the reorganization. Yeah. And that you appoint somebody as your chair to run the meeting tonight because I don't think I should be doing it. Um, sort of a point of order, Robert's rules, wouldn't, the, the, wouldn't we just default to the vice chair in the absence of our chair anyway? So, Karen, I, I don't know the answers okay. to these questions. <laughs> I just think if you take an action, that, right? if you just take an action to do something for tonight, and then say you're going to come back to it and set your next meeting date to do all that work on the board reorganization. Um, okay. When we have our yeah, I mean the the, the point. I mean, yeah. Will actually said to me, "Do you need to have a meeting tonight?" And I was thinking in the work that we've done in the past week and a half. You wanted to get, I took it as the board, yeah, we, wanted yeah. to get to an election, get to the budget vote. So yeah, I said, we need to have one by Friday. He said, well, then it got into, well, maybe this, maybe that. And I was like, okay, enough of that. Yeah. I, I think it's, I mean, it's, it sounds like a reasonable solution to me. Okay. Anyone have concerns? I'll make a motion. To, to, okay. <laughs> I moved it. We elect Kari Bradley as the chair for this meeting. And I'll second it. Is everyone available on the 20th? Mm -hmm. Mr. Merriam, are you available on the 20th? Yes, yeah, Mary Mann, actually. Mary Mann, sorry. Charlie, I know you stepped out. Did you hear everything I was able to say or get the direction I was trying to go, which was to table all the reorganization until? right thing to do here. There's well, well, there's some question about the time, how fast you have to do this and whether it's one meeting or not, but that's the thing we couldn't figure out. 
I, and that's why it said go to your own legal counsel. Yeah. This is the best option. Just the point of news, that's our winter sports celebration that night, so oh, you might have to <coughs> duck out for a minute or two. For for the festivities? For your own children. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Just, just as a heads up. All right. Appreciate it. We can look at that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, all those in favor of Karen's motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions? Thank you, folks. Thanks. Okay, so we'll proceed. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Um, so reception of guests, thank you for being here. Did, did you have anything that you wanted to I address I wanted to make sure that U52 is aware of Berlin's unexpected predicament as far as school board. Okay, um, let, let's cover that in public comments, which is coming right up. Um, agenda revisions, are we have, we're basically revising the first portion of the agenda. We're going to go right to a consent agenda and not cover reorganization. Anything else that people want? Do I have a, um, I have a question about the music program that I will, I'll ask during the administrative report. That's okay. Good. All right. So public comments. Do you want to share your concerns? Yeah, I'm not sure. Bill, did you get I haven't. That's as far as I have like a list of four or five questions. So Corinne and Corinne's been part of this. We're trying to figure out the Secretary of State has told us something different than um, the way I investigate this. I had investigated this a couple, like five, six years ago and was trained in it in my first superintendent training about who, if the select board appoints or if, the, if there needs to be a special meeting for the Berlin Elementary School to have a majority of representatives, because currently they let me, let, me, uh, let me back yeah, up yeah, yeah. a moment. So we had one board member who didn't need to be on the ballot. We had four seats open. We had one person running unopposed. So we had three empty seats. Our understanding was that if nobody was voted in as a write-in, which had the possibility of happening but did not, that the select board would therefore appoint to get us to the quorum, and then the school board would be able to appoint any further members. But we found out this morning that is not so. What we're hearing from the Secretary of State's office is that we need to have a special election in order to get our board up to quorum or full, whichever the case may be, and which then runs a little bit more in that we understand that this board and potentially some of the other boards are looking at having a budget vote April 9th, and it's very unfortunate to find out we wouldn't be able to piggyback on that because the deadline for a candidate to have a petition in in order to be on a ballot on April 9th would have been Monday. We really hate the thought of having two different votes a week or two apart from each other. But we weren't even quite sure with what came out of the court and all if you guys were still even looking at an April 9th date. So I came up just to okay. make sure you knew the predicament we were in and to find out what you guys are doing. And Corinne, just so you know, we have three other board mem uh, boards that are set up to go for April 9th right now. So all <coughs> four are ready to go. I, Krista told me the predicament today. Yeah. I, if you weren't here, I was going to say the same thing and just say, you know, it, if it went a week longer, which is April 15th, April 16th, 16th which is a day past, mm. you know, teacher day, teacher day, which there's a different question that you can, you can be asked about the teacher contracts and whether you want to go with those or not, uh, whether you have a budget or not. That's a different question. But I just wanted, to, I was going to give the same information, Corinne, that yeah. you, you were bringing okay. tonight. So the board knows that information. All right. In addition, and in addition, in addition mm -hmm. I would give you more information on all of that that the Secretary of Education just issued the warning for our district organizational meeting to be Monday, April 8th. Okay. Because that will give a, but if there needs to be a merged budget vote and looking at all the timeline, the first time that that could happen is June 25th. Kind of on the late side. Yeah, but at least it's within this, yeah. this fiscal year. Right. Um, and that was that was tightening everything up in the past few days. We've been calendaring and tightening things up as tight as it possibly could be within reason to make sure things got done without making mistakes. Mm -hmm. It gave us about four or five days in between each action and the next warning that had to go. 
clarify for me again the Monday, April 8th meeting is? It would be the district organizational meeting that was that adjourned. That is the, the new single district? Yes. Okay. That was adjourned in it February. Would be, it would be that meeting. It reopened. would be that meeting. And then if everything were to go as planned, somewhere around mid-May would be elections. Yeah. And then from there would be a June 25th. Uh, I could get my calendar out for the May yeah, one. Nice. Just get the idea that there's three forty, <clears throat> thirty to forty day windows, and it's taking thirty day windows and having three or four days for whatever entity it is to get to the next warning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really tight. Yeah, but the agency was definitive that they're planning they, to warn us. They they sent it to us today. Okay, okay. They sent it at about four thirty this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. So lots of new information here. Um, before we get into that, let's go to our consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 6th, February 13th, and February 25th? Sure. Scott, second? Second. Carl, any comments? They look good. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed for abstention? Okay, so that passes. So let's talk about review of fiscal 20 budget. Um, maybe the maybe the place to start with this topic because budget and morning are similar is uh, for those of us who weren't here on Monday, could we be provided a summary of the legal opinion the council that we received? Scott and Carl were here. Yeah, I was here. <coughs> Stephen was here. I think that's everyone. That, I was in the audience. Yeah, you were in the audience. But yeah, I mean, I'd let the two of you start. And, <laughs> I was reading the board orders when you introduced it. <laughs> um, we're talking about Monday's meeting. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With Chris Leopold. Basically, my takeaway from it. Let me see if I can organize this a little bit in my head. I I came away from it, and I think Scott would agree that it looked like taking the two courses of action was our best bet. That. Warning the warning the local budget vote, and then if you know, and then when the then when this new district is formed, they would warn a second they'd warn a second budget vote, um, and that the second would just nullify the first in that case. The biggest concern we had about that, I think, was public confusion, Pe people already being confused and not understanding why they're voting on the budget twice. The, the budgets will be very similar as I understand it, but one would be a single budget and one would be broken out for each of the each, each of each of our local boards would be having their own budget vote. And then that would assuming that we end up with the with the single organization, that vote would then replace the other. Nobody could really identify any nobody in the whole system that anybody could speak of could could point to any real like legal slippery ground that we were on in that case. We're doing what we're supposed to do based on our original, you know, organization, and and that would simply be superseded by the new organization should it come online. Um, and that way we're we, that way we've got some confidence that we can send out the teacher contracts by the fifteenth. Um, if we didn't have a budget by July 1st, we'd start the year with an 87.5%. 87. 87%. We'd, we'd have the authority to borrow up to 87% of the previous year's budget until we got another budget voted on. And we could choose whether to start operating the year with a scaled down, scaled down expenditures or assume that we're going to get a fuller budget before March rolls around and we're suddenly up against our 87% ceiling. That would be that would be up to the board at that time to figure out how they wanted to do that. But, but for our purposes today, it looks like there's nothing stopping us from warning a budget meeting based on what we've developed at this point. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks. So it seems like the <coughs> advantage of warning uh, as uh, individual U32 budget is that if somehow there is not a vote on a unified budget, then we still have a path forward to, the, the ultimate goal here must be to keep the school running and exactly. orderly yeah. operations. Yes. Right? Yeah. And in shorter term, it's to get that contract in front of the teachers right. with the confidence that we've got the budget as we planned it. 
yeah. as opposed to putting that contract out there not knowing if we can really afford to pay for it. And April 15th is the date that the contracts, the, the contracts are, need yeah, to be Yeah, I mean, the, the thing I would tell you, and I, um, yeah, we looked at it last week, uh, Lauren, I say we, Lauren and I did. And right now, if you look at your fixed expenses and all the staff, you take all the staff, fixed expenses for the budget, your debt payments, and your assessments for Washington Central, for the proposed budget, not for net, because that 87% is off of this current year. I didn't do the percentages off this current year, I just did, but the proposed budget, it's about 90% of your expenditures. The staffing is about, all the staffing, all the human resource costs are 63%, all the, for next year's budget, 63% of it is staffing costs. About 10% are fixed costs, 4% is debt, and Washington Central Special Education and Washington Central Operations, this doesn't include transportation, is 12.8%. So that totals up to be about 90 80, it's around 89 to 90%. Mm -hmm. I, I did it with whole numbers. You do it on the calculator and you get the decimals mm -hmm. in the right place. Okay, but, um, all right, so again, if, if for some reason we didn't have a vote on a unified budget, it would make sense for us to move forward with a, you know, to have this individual budget as a, as a safeguard. Right. If there is a vote on the unified budget, whether it passes or not, the the individual user two budget is moot at that point. That's what we believe that that's yeah. right at this point. Yeah. Just, uh, so I sent an email to you because uh, Scott Carl were here and Chris Leopold wanted to look at some articles of agreement. Mm -hmm. After investigating, that's not an option for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is too bad. Yeah. But they, had, when you read the Rutland Northeast, which I did that mm -hmm. the next day. They had had their electorate still vote on the merge budget. They just said we're going to put it together just the same way we did, but said mm -hmm. it in their articles. Yeah. And, and there may be an advantage, just a, a political advantage, in having voted on the separate budgets when um, the merged budget comes up for a vote. Mm. If people say, well, each individual budget has been approved, then it's why, not like why a, would we second guess? Why, why would we change yeah, our mind um, four weeks later? Yeah, and and shoot down, you know, something that we we have separately shoot down together something that we have separately agreed is is a solid approach, a solid budget. And let's turn back to Berlin. Where 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 would Berlin fit into oh, this scenario? Berlin, <laughs> Berlin. I'm so, so sorry. So this is this is part of the issue of. Um, they would need they need six Mondays. Did you say that, Corinne? But they need six Mondays for any election when you have someone being elected on a ballot. There needs to be six Mondays from when the petitions are in to the election. Yeah. And so that actually makes it longer. It's one of the things. It's a longer step in the merge piece as well. So it's longer than thirty days, but you have to have that. That's in statute. Hmm. So in order to do that, they go all the way to the sixteenth. Uh, of April. So, Corinne, you, you, did your budget budget pass? Yes, it did. Yeah. Everything was approved. For Wonderful. Rolling. So, so you you have a budget, but you just don't have a board. board. We have a budget. We have no board. My understanding from reading statutes is that they can actually approve um, paying bills, but that's it. They can't actually meet. And we understand that it would be the two of them that would sign a warning for the meeting. Even though there's only two of them, that's what Secretary of State is saying. So, so ideally, you would have us have a U32 budget vote on the 16th to align with your. Board. That would be our druthers. We understand it may not be practical for other reasons, yeah. but the downside of that is we we'd have to we have to see the contracts yeah. without the confidence that we had a budget. And that seems that, like a pretty big implication. Doesn't mean yeah. that we can't. We can we can issue the contract. You can you can. It is and done other the places. math that Bill just gave us would suggest that if staffing is sixty three percent of that budget, that awesome. eighty seven covered you know eighty seven percent would at least cover our staff. Yeah, but the, there's but something else might suffer as a result. Yeah, and there's another problem with the sixteenth. It's in the middle of school vacation. If I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's yes. a terrible. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, yeah. Oh, 
I, 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 I'm so sorry, but my inclination is to basically cut the lifeline <laughs> and set you adrift. Um, we sure wish that. <laughs> it sounds cruel. Well, we wish that the information had been correct, that it was the select board. The select board had switched so, so to Thursday meetings, and so they were all set to think that they were going to be appointing somebody if we had somebody to appoint, and that was actually looking positive too, but mm. we're told that can't be done. Mm, that's terrible. Yeah. It's hard to flush out this many school boards. Mm. Yeah. Well, dedicated, qualified people. Well, the, um, well actually, for, for Berlin, I don't think anybody wants to be associated with having Act 46 happen, is my understanding, which is It's radioactivity problem. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, so, does anybody have concerns and want to uh, express concerns about this approach? Or? Going forward with the morning of the night. Everybody clear about the budget? Do we need to revisit the budget that we're recommending to the electorate? I just tell you, and I don't need to go through it, but some numbers have changed just because you've heard equalized pupils finally got yeah. mm -hmm. okay. got frozen around uh, February, somewhere between the 11th and the 20th of February. So everything I told you earlier about equalized, those have actually, I think, improved a little bit for U32. Okay. But the, the cost per equalized people is down a little bit, um, but not a lot. Uh, do, you, do you remember what the increase per, per pupil is? I don't remember what the increase is. I can, I might have that right here. Is it on the warning? Uh, it, on the warning, the way, if you That's look at age, it, remember the <coughs> language was set by the legislature three years ago, uh -huh. that for the warning, the way you have to do it is that you have to have the overall budget, but what it is, per equalized pupil and then what the percentage is higher from last year. Mm -hmm. So the warning, if you look at page 16, you'll see that it's a $15 million budget. Um, it's $18,809 per equalized pupil. And this is projected spending of 4.17%. I will tell you in the legislature, they just had a report last Friday that changed the dollar yield so that would change all those figures. Uh, and that will keep changing all the way to the end of the session. Okay. So just to you real, you know, when you talk with folks, mm -hmm. we give you our best estimates, but those things change because the legislature has the authority to set the dollar yield. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that, I mean that, from last year, let me just look. <coughs> I don't have last year's figure with me. No, I'm just trying to answer yeah. your question. Well, Thanks. Yeah, my question was about the 4.17 percent yeah. that shows up on that. Yeah. But the expense budget is still the same—a 2.98 percent increase. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. you have that in your. Right. So it's just the, the pupil. It's a per pupil, yeah. and that, as you've been told, are, we're losing <coughs> lots of pupils. Yeah. We're doing it. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the the one place that's. Relatively constant C's on the figures the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, I mean, it looks like a defensible budget to me. I mean, it's, it's well done. There's nothing, nothing that looks weird or kind of. Good. <laughs> who, who here shared these numbers at their town meeting yesterday? Um, I didn't. No. They weren't shared at Berlin. I, I did at East Montpelier. It was interesting. There were lots of questions. T-shirts, pets. There was an hour and a half discussion of, of the elementary school and Act 46. A, a fair amount of discussion about student learning outcomes and you know the information I presented. And then I finally got to the budget after you know two and a half hours up there and nothing. It was crickets. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I think people were talked out, but no. Yeah. You know, well, it was kind of crickets kind of on Monday, Monday too. The, the, question, the questions that were raised to Berlin was, why don't we have a U32 budget to vote on right now? And Chris Winters answered that question, yeah. um, saying that you guys were going to meet and that there was, yeah, yeah, pretty much the process that we're all a part of. Yeah. Okay. 
So we probably have a, another meeting where one of us and Stephen gets to see you'll him. You'll need to have an yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, <coughs> ten okay. days prior to the budget, you'll need to have informational okay. meetings. Oh. All meetings on Australia. Ten days prior. Within ten days, within of, ten days. of the election. Oh, within? Within it ten days. It could be the night before. Like, really. It could be the night before, or it could be, but it has to be within ten days. Good, good call. So it's, um, we'll talk about that next time, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You could actually maybe have that at your April meeting if you're for, if you're staying with the if you stay with the first Wednesday of the month. Um, is there any more discussion of either the budget or the warning? Is it okay if we move right to the action agenda and take care of this? Sure. So to entertain a motion to approve the I think we've already approved the budget, but I might as well do it again. You, you, you have not. Recommended, have not. We looked back in the mansion. Oh, right, right. Yeah, okay. To the, to the transition. <coughs> so yes. I, I actually, uh, in prepping this agenda, put it, I thought it would be good for you to approve the budget. Yeah, yeah no, yes. absolutely. Okay. So let me, uh, so is there a motion to approve the FY20 budget as shown on page nine? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? All those. <coughs> sure. <coughs> it's fifteen million one hundred fifty nine thousand one hundred ninety six dollars. No. Any other, oh, okay. any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstention? Okay, so that passes. Is there a motion to approve the FY20 warning on page 16? I think we need to add the date to that, is that right? Um, adding the date of April and month. Yes. Yep. What's this, what's this business of a public hearing? Um, so it was, that, when would you like to set the public hearing? You've done that on your warnings in the past to okay. let people know. I was suggesting to you that you would have a meeting, let me get my calendar out, because I am learning that I do not do numbers without support. That April 3rd would be your first first Wednesday, and you could have that as part of the, That's within 10 days of the 9th, and you could, um, you could have it. So we're having a regular meeting that day? Yes, so just do your informational meeting that day. Does that make sense? Check it. Yeah. Great. So April 3rd, and then it would not be the municipalities' respective town meetings. You have to change that language as well. Uh, can, we, can we just yes. say on the articles to be voted on by Australian ballot? I'm sorry, I'm just not quite up with you. The rest of that paragraph. Uh, actually, are you in the public hearing? Yeah, public hearing will take place. They said they do, 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 provide information. All right, let's Legal voice on the area. We'll we'll take a look at it. Maybe my copy that I have here does not have that on it anymore. I'm looking at the one you would actually sign. Oh, did it? What does it read? It says a public hearing will take place at U32 room 128 131 at 6 p.m. on. And we would change it from. We would change it to say April 3rd. Okay. To provide information on the articles voted by Australian ballot at the municipal respective locations on okay. April 9th. Right. Mine's this time meeting. So. Yeah, I think it's it's the old one that you have there, and Krista's. We, as we always do, we have the signature page, and after you set these tonight, we finish this. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll move it. Okay. I'll second. Karen, any discussion? Um, Carl's taking a quick look at something, so something's right mm. in his head. Um, well, 10 to 7, polling places and times. I will feel Worcester. Worcester. Yeah. It does have a time meeting. Would, yeah, we're meeting. Worcester yes. doesn't vote for their, has never voted for their school budget by Australian ballot. Not even year 32? We had. Yes, yes. U32. Uh, yeah, you're right. U32 we do. I, I'm sorry. I, yeah. We can do U32. <laughs> this is single U32. I'm just being yeah. harder on myself. <laughs> We're okay. You, you have to. We're okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, they're, they're actually setting that town meeting right now. <laughs> the the Doty the Doty board. Yeah. yeah. And it may or may not be the same day. Yeah. Lots of voting this year. 
Okay. We're trying to get it all the same day to help the town clerks out yeah. as much as we can. And that's their plan is to try and get it that day. Yeah, they're trying to get it that day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, Jonathan, George, Corinne, about sort of making life difficult for Berlin. Or not making life easier for Berlin, let me put it that way. Yeah. You, you may want to wait another week to pass a cool break and get a little more separation. I, mean, I don't know. We just like all wrap up and be able to have our board meet. Yeah. They won't be able to meet until it happens. <coughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes. And I will be passing around the warning page okay. signature page. Great. Thank you. All right, so let's move to reports to the board. Central Vermont Career Center. Yeah, they haven't met it. <coughs> Yeah. How's it going? Good. <laughs> um, Congratulations, by the way. Yeah, thank you. That brings me to my first point, which is that um, both the girls and boys Nordic <coughs> ski teams won the championships on Monday, wow. which was the first time that happened like at the same time in like 20 years or something, Mark Chapman said. Um, so that happened. Obviously, there was February vacation. Um, the eighth grade plays also happened the week before break, and on a very exciting um, I guess environmentally friendly note, our cafeteria has shifted away from single-use plastic, um, which I was very happy to learn about. Um, so basically, the only like single-use plastic they're using, I want to say, is like coffee cups or something. But other than that, like it's gotten a lot more environmentally friendly, which the students are pretty happy about. I think mostly. Um, Excuse me, Lucy. Was yes. that a green team initiative or? Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it was a green team working with Brian to sort of. Because they, uh, my understanding is Green Team wanted there to be more environmentally friendly options in the cafeteria, and it also helped, um, from what I heard, it helped the food service economically, so like, it helped everybody. Um, yeah, so that was exciting. Um, There's also a climate change presentation at our school, which I didn't go to, but some science classes did, and members of Green Team did, and I heard positive things about it. Um, on a proficiency note, as many of you have probably heard about, um, juniors are really starting to talk about the possibility of summer school, and that's sort of like there was a meeting. How long ago was that? Like a couple months ago. It's been like a month, yeah. But yeah. people are sort of getting it in their head more that that's a potential option for the junior class, um, mostly because of proficiency. And then I know it's nobody's favorite topic, but there definitely has been talk about. Um, Act 46 among teachers and students, mostly like, what does it mean and how is it going to work? And what do you mean it's nobody's favorite topic? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a, a loaded subject, um, but a lot of students like don't really know what it is. Um, so the Chronicle is in the process of trying to like come up with a couple articles or just pointers because students don't really know what's going on and it's going to um, directly impact them and their community. Yeah. But, um, could you say a little more about the level of concern about proficiencies and graduating next year? Yeah, so I wish Mia couldn't make it tonight, but I know she has a better perspective than I do since she's under the proficiency-based system. But I know um, for a lot of juniors, the very real option for them, because they haven't been on track, is either go to summer school this summer and make up the work that they haven't been doing, or um, face potentially like either right a fifth year of high school potentially, or like a very stressful senior year because everything, they have to like meet all of these standards. Um, and I think a lot of them are sort of starting to wrap their heads around it um, because it's, proficiency I mean has been a thing for their class for a while, but like as graduation for them is looming, it's sort of starting to become a bit more clear um, what they need to do and what that might look like for their summer. And, and two semesters to get it done. And yeah, exactly. Else. And like yeah. they're going to be applying to college in the fall, too, so right. like right. figuring out what that looks like as well. And, and are we talking about dozens of students or? Like that are concerned? Yeah. Well, I mean, like a month ago, there was a meeting with the junior class that Steve, just you hosted it, right? Mm -hmm. That Stephen hosted about. Yeah, with the TAs. About the TAs, about um, 
summer school. So everybody's aware of it. Obviously, I think some kids are more concerned than others. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was yeah. a little more broad than just summer school. Okay, that was the message that everybody heard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what we did tell them at that meeting, I, I, I don't mean to step on, no, on Lucy with this, is just the... Um, there, there are a couple of components like here's how you need to look at whether or not you're meeting proficiency so there's a way to track it and see it on um, infinite campus um, showed them that process um, really tried to, to show them that you know in the past that um, you know just sitting in the class got you there that doesn't work now you know you need to demonstrate that you know these things and, and I think that um, I heard a great quote from an, another um, school that's talking about you know students now demonstrate that they can graduate instead of calculate whether or not they could graduate. And so I thought that was a really good way to think about the change in a proficiency system. And so some of our kids, I think Lucy said it right, is that realize that they need to do their work. And, um, and so they, they're awakening to this possibility. Summer school is going to be an option for some kids to be able to, uh, to get some of that work done. Um, some of our kids, through no fault of their own, I mean, they've been a part of some of the other programs. So um, Central Vermont Career Center does, um, doesn't offer quite everything, and we don't have enough time for them to do it. So if they want to do some additional programs at CVCC for their senior year, it might benefit them to go ahead and just take a summer class to get a couple of, um, of the proficiencies taken care of, like um, a health if they put it off, a financial literacy, um, some of those other programs. So, so there's some options there that can help kids get a little bit ahead as well. Um, but with, right now the interest is pretty low actually for the summer school, like kids that are doing it. Um, I would say this in the past, um, if we showed you a student schedule, um, their senior year was typically English and some other things that they might want to take. Um, some students chose to do math and science and all that, but it wasn't required if they'd already taken three math or three science courses. Um, now what we're saying to kids is that you haven't demonstrated that you know those things at a level that you're prepared for uh, CVCC or state college, um, which is what we think of as proficient. Um, and so you might need to spend some time your senior year preparing because I think one of the other goals of proficiency is as we all look at it across the not just the state, but the country, is that we don't want kids doing remedial courses when they go to college, right? And, and our hope is to guarantee that they have the knowledge to start taking credit-bearing courses as they head off to college. That may not have been our standard in the past, right? And so that's, that's where I think we're, we're, we're having a better understanding of the conversation now with, with the kids is that you're gonna be prepared, you know, to be able to go to trade school or to go to a community college or or you know any college really for that matter, and then some of our kids are going to choose to go to more competitive schools, and they're going to need that time to to do the more advanced courses. I think, like you said, it's like among the student body, the junior class is sort of having to like lead this culture shift that's happening because, yeah. like kids in my class, like they can just show up and maybe do a couple of things and still graduate, but the class below us is forced to actually like understand the material, which obviously in the long term is very helpful, um, but it's definitely a lot, a lot more work that they have to do, and I think that's not a thing that's been asked of kids in the past. Like there are plenty of kids. That migrate that can just show well, up. Well, also being the first, it seems to me like we may not have, you know, been preparing them as well, you know, in, when they were in ninth grade as, you know, next year's ninth graders. Correct. We'll, we'll we'll get a lot more information up front. Well, the you know, as they ask questions, we come up with the answers, and the questions have continuously, you know, we, we get more and more complex with those questions, and so we have more and more complex answers to how do I take care of this? How do I do this? What does it look like? Uh, also, my understanding of the system is that you do a lot of preparation early and then you're demonstrating proficiency late. Yeah. Which has got to be stressful if you if you don't have, there's no track record, right? We don't, we can't right. really say, oh, it's okay, most people get all this done in senior year. So the, junior, the second half of your junior year should be where there's a big acceleration yeah. in all of that. And, we're, and we can see it with some kids. So what, what we can see is those kids who may have um, accelerated, like taken algebra in the eighth grade or something like that, we see that they're really starting to show proficiency in the math or some of the science as they finish the courses that other kids are finishing their junior year, they finish in their sophomore year. 
And so we are starting to see those things. We're also seeing holes in our curriculum. You know, there, you know we, we adopted the SLOs that had um, standards associated with them, and we find out that our curriculum wasn't as strong in sustainability in science, engineering, um, and statistics, um, and um, economics. And those were areas where we just, we realized we weren't giving kids a lot of chances to learn it. And so we have to boost our uh, you know, curriculum. We're not gonna hold the kids responsible for something that we can't offer them, right? That, um, but we are gonna hold them responsible for what we could offer them. Uh, and so we want it to be a little bit higher um, in the long run, but we realized that our curriculum wasn't built around some of those areas of the depth that we really want. Like in my pre-comp class, because of the lack of the statistics standard being met earlier, we're doing a unit by the end of the year, mostly for the juniors, so that they can check the statistics box on their train or not transcript. What is it? SLOs. Yeah, that. but on their transcript. Yeah. yeah. So as as every junior had a chance to assess where they are and create a plan to get for So we, we showed their TAs. Um, we, we need to, we, there's an additional round of information that we need to get out to parents now, just so that they can go through and look at, at some of those same things. But, um, but their TAs, the school counselors, the students have already started looking at that, uh, particularly around scheduling when we, when we went through that process. So that's why we did it with the juniors when we did it, because they were just going into the scheduling time for next year. I can give you the perspective of a parent going with someone going into ninth grade next year and the meeting with the TA and looking at scheduling, Duncan's schedule next year, was also looking at uh, learning outcomes and being able to make sure we're working on proficiency in multiple areas. And mm -hmm. that will, you know, if you do this, that will satisfy part of your progress in this. So I found it very uh, Yay. refreshing. And it felt like the TA under. <laughs> Well, you know, we were going all around the book, but, you know, it felt like, you know, they understood how to guide the parent and the child through making those decisions. And, you know, we were weighing decisions like doing some work now versus putting it off till later and, and making those choices. So I, I, yeah. I think the ones coming up are benefit. <laughs> yeah, from I, I think you make an interesting point. I think that this is something that um, we need to communicate more is that you can't do everything at once. You're here for four years in high school. It, it takes four years to get, we have a pretty decent body of knowledge and, and skills that we want kids to be able to do. In the past, we tried to pack a lot of that into the first three years of high school so that there was an easier time or there was something different in their senior year. Um, and, and we really reserved the senior year for those kids who wanted to go to the, the more elite schools to get you know, additional piece. But now we're saying to every kid is that you may have, it may take you all four years of taking classes and doing work to be able to satisfy our learning outcomes. And I, I think that, that that's something that we didn't communicate well early on, but I think that's something that we communicate a little better and we need to get better at a longer term. Because, you know, we, we do have you for four years and our community pays for four years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you well, should all be given the benefit. Just as much as you get a senior. So. And, 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 mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sorry, we kind of took over your report. Yeah. No, it was, it was good. But like you said, it's, it's all part of the like shift that's happening. Because with seniors, like there's like a very small percentage of the class that like takes APs and gets all their college credit. Not all of them, but like some of their college credits. But most people just don't do anything. It's almost like you could do high school in three years. When you're right. under the old system. But there are electives and things. Like yeah, that there are. But like nothing. Like the only required thing for a lot of seniors, unless you've failed other things, is English. So. Questions for Lucy? All right, administration. So I just wanted to report to you on a couple of things from Tuesday. Um, as you know, we had write-ins for the clerk and treasurer, and Mary Ormsby had enough uh, votes in both clerk and treasurer to be the clerk and treasurer for the next year, for U32. So I wanted to let you know that, that that's all set. I don't have much more to report to you besides we've been in a lot of meetings trying to work the work of the budget and uh, getting that elected and where we are. We had those discussions. So thanks, Stephen. Can that be your bill to add? Yeah, I think, Carr, you had a question for us in the administrative report. I do. You, you ready for me? Absolutely. So um, uh, I heard a 
story today that um, music is no longer a requirement of some creators, or will in the future no longer be a requirement. So music was never officially a requirement. Uh, and, and when you say it, being in chorus, band, or orchestra was right. never a requirement, um, officially. It was right. unofficially a requirement. Uh -huh. um, what we did was, um, I actually met with the elementary principals around this, and we asked, um, I asked of them in the leadership team, how should we present this? Like, what, what do we want? And, and the consensus was is that we have a SLO that is an um, artistic expression. And how can you satisfy your artistic expression SLO? It's through music, it's through theater, it's through it's visual and performing arts. Right? And so there's a wider range of things. And so um, our, our feeling was is that why don't we offer the electives of seventh and eighth grade as the artistic expression uh, elective as opposed to a you have to take music or you have to take or you have to take music instead we say you have to take something within the artistic expression it's a it's a broader field and um, and so that was so the way we placed it on the seventh grade choice sheet for um, for this next year is that we asked them to choose from artistic expression um, which area they wanted to go into and um, and some students can choose there is no limit if a student wanted to do art and wanted to do music there could be space in their schedule for that we don't limit that but we ask them to choose at least something from the um, artistic expression uh, possibilities um, as opposed to just music as a requirement uh, but middle schoolers are not demonstrating proficiency are they're not but they're gearing towards it I mean, you know, everything is still, but we pre-K through 12, we have so yes, a lot. I think just a little bit, and you've heard this before as a board, we have performance indicators. Yeah. So just as, you know, we were talking about with Lucy, it, it comes later that you actually know you're proficient in that, in that proficiency, that you meet proficiency, but you need to know, are you kind of like along the journey, it's mileposts along the journey, and that's what those performance indicators are. So those are good ones yeah. to have. Yeah, no, I understand that. I guess, um, I don't know if people share this concern at all, but um, it seems like one of the great things about middle school is you get to try a whole bunch of things. And some, th some, some things are electives, and some things we traditionally made you try. Um, like, and like music, I think music comes to mind. And it's interesting to hear that it wasn't a requirement, it was an unofficial requirement, whatever that means. Right. But it forced people to, to give that a try and, and um, if, if that wasn't for you, so be it. But this was kind of your kind of your shot at it because it's much harder to pick up music later in life, as we all know, right? Um, Languages. So, so I guess one of my concerns is is what are there implications for students not trying music, and another one is what is the implications for the program? You know, because that's the right. that's where you know. Well, this is where this is where actually a district discussion has to occur because what we saw, and this is what typically happened, um, students who were um, who moved towards the orchestra was a very limited number of kids who, for the most part, had private lessons while they were in elementary yeah. school. The students who gravitated towards the band program were those students who had some kind of band program at one of their elementary schools, which is not at every elementary school. Um, so they had some kind of musical instrument, some kind of opportunity there. And then all the other students, as the requirement, were forced to take chorus. Or they could or they get the digital guitar. music. Or the digital music piece we added in because we were having difficulty. Because Kids like, okay, so I don't play, I've never had the opportunity to play an instrument and I don't want to. I certainly am not picking up a stringed instrument because you know, my, there's all kinds of issues around that. Like, I am not singing, right? And then, so we had to develop the digital music program to, to give them another option within that little band. And, you know, we, we weren't, we're actually finding success right now with the band program because we're, we have more band programs in the elementary schools than any other program and our program is also visiting the elementary schools to generate interest which you know and and here's how you can learn to play and this is and so we split up the band into a true beginner band and like an intermediate middle school band that is those kids that already have some stuff so we have a small group of kids who chose to pick up an instrument and our biggest issue 
is frankly strings in orchestra right now. Yeah. We need somebody that can work amongst the elementary schools. We have great music teachers at the elementary schools, but only one has a background in strings. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that's as easy to pick up as in band when you can switch from one instrument to another. So we need, we need someone that can do some of that work yeah. at the elementary schools. There's a lot of concern around that, and I think rightly so. Yeah, this is the, the bigger issue, uh, really and truly, comes down to equity mm -hmm. and access um, for our kids before they come to us. Um, sure. It, is, is probably the bigger issue. It's not the requirement that we had, it's the issue of do they have the opportunities before they get to us? Mm -hmm. um, because right. that's, I mean, what we were finding was the kids would endure their one year of chorus and drop it immediately. Mm -hmm. Our feeling was is if we have visual and performing arts as a whole, that we at least give the kids multiple options to, to start engaging in artistic expression. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, I don't think we're gonna see, I, I really don't believe we're gonna see a wholesale loss of the program because of this. I think what we're gonna do is see a growth in the overall VAPA program as to what kids find. They're gonna identify with one area or, or two um, that they really feel strong about, and they may dabble in some of the others. I mean, that's kind of how it works once you get to high school, is you, know, you might focus on pottery, but you might try out drawing. You know, it's those kinds of things. The art program, generally speaking, at the middle school level, gives the kids a broad range of all of those things. So they try drawing, they try pottery, you know, they do a little bit of each of those things to see which one might be interesting to them. So that kind of survey course and all that. Very interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Any other questions for administrators? I'd like to share one thing. Um, we have three members of the student restorative panel and two members of Branching Out who will be working with the Montpelier Community Justice Center to set up a youth panel for our area. So it's very exciting. They're meeting next week. And I just think it's important to say that our students are at the middle of that. Mm -hmm. Um, along with a bunch of adults from Washington County Schools. Yeah, that's an extension of our restorative practice that we, that Jody has been leading a great deal of. Yeah. So, what would it look like? What would, what would you, what would you be um, Community Justice Center has recognized that when youths offend and are sent through their process, that they they struggle more with um, interactions with the adult panels. They seem to do yeah. better if they can have peers brought in. Sure. Um, so they're thinking that if they could have a panel of peers, that they might be able to get further with those students in changing behaviors. That's pretty great. That's awesome. And we have a microcosm of that. So yeah. our, our detention time, which is not called that anymore, community. is called community. And, um, and that's where some of these students came out of, right? Is, am I correct on that they met with that? Uh, some of our, the students that are working on this have mm -hmm. met with them as part of the restorative panel here. Yeah. yeah, and so we try to practice some of these same things. With and Lucy's on our panel as well, and she's it certainly worked to have the student panel um, here work through some issues with peers because um, they've resolved them. Cool. Great. Kari, can I give one other piece that Please is either do. this or finance? It's kind of a bit of both. Right. With the uncertainty of our budget, um, we had to start looking at the track project. And what would we do with that? Because if we didn't have a budget and we were going to 87%, the board can look at that million dollar project and say maybe that's something we would need to use that money instead of for the track but for operations for FI 20. Um, in talking with Du Bois Construction, they've given us a 30 day extension to award them the contract. We had to have it in by March 4th, so now it's due April 4th. So in the next meeting, I'm going to want to talk to you a lot more about it. You know, it's about a million dollar project as you approved as a board. And they know they have it, and they were willing to give us a 30 day extension to kind of figure out where we were with budgets in Act 46. Mm -hmm. But that's going to, I mean, Romney's going to have the same question around the boiler. That's a 65 to 75 thousand dollar project, and I know some of the other buildings with some of their summer projects. So. It's, we have a little bit of breathing room, but we will need to talk about that. In hindsight, it would have been 
better to ask for five week extension. So <laughs> it was one of those things I actually said that actually um, the way the RFP went out, we and they signed in on it is that we would sign a contract within 30 days. They were gracious. And yeah, no, I, I, they, they came to us and said, we will get, you know, I started talking to them about where we were at and they said, the project manager, Nick, said to me, so well, let me go talk to the owners. And he came back two days later, he said, we'll give you another 30 days. We'd like to do the work. And because we can't postpone it indefinitely because of the uh, bid laws in Vermont, we would have had to go all the way back through a whole other RFP <laughs> process. <laughs> which we didn't want to go through. So by Du Bois saying, hey, we'll give you another 30 days, it gave us a little bit of breathing room right now. But it's something we'll need to talk about. The thing is, if we have to make a decision on April 3rd, and we're, we're basically in the same boat we are today. I understand that, and I didn't want to get into it big, but I wanted to preview it so that since we're gonna to get together later on in the month, we'll get you some more support materials behind that, and then you as a board can advise which way you'd like to go. But you know, just to preview it from my perspective, because Bill and I had a conversation about like, how do we think about this? It's really about risk. How yeah. much are we willing to risk um, if the budget doesn't pass and we've signed a contract for, for this track? You know, what are the implications of that? So uh, it, I'm just suggesting it may be in Du Bois's best interest to give us a little bit more time, you know, three more days if we could pledge to meet the day after the vote. Right, and, and that may be what we come out of the next meeting, and I'd be glad to do that, but I think as a board you should have that discussion. I'd be glad to communicate that back through to the boys and say, hey, this is our timeline. Can we do that? But they just came back with that, and I, you know, I, after I conferred with Kari, because Adrian wasn't around, I, as a vice chair, I said, this is where we're at right now, and uh, just trying to get everything figured out here. We are still going ahead with the elevator and the hood project. Uh, the elevator because we'll be out of ADA compliance, and the hood because we'd be out of health care, uh, out of health regulations for the kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. We would have to shut down the kitchen. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so those two projects are going forward, and they're quite expensive. Okay. Questions about that? That brings us to finance. Well, page 17 is looked like there was quite a bit of updating in January, but not since. No. Have we haven't. Have we looked at the finance report since. You January? you had one you had one meeting where you looked at it. Okay. Uh, but this is this is the same report since then. And in January in January, which this was came into you in February, Lori went through the budget and um, really tried to project all the costs at the end of the year, hmm. uh, and thinking about. As I've talked to you many times about, the biggest piece of the whole merger process is really the financial and all the business implications. So Lori did actually a deeper dive than she usually does in January and really tried to predict everything as if she were closing the books okay. right in January. So this is pretty tight. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Any, any questions about the financial report? No questions, uh, but uh, I feel much more comfortable with the, where the fund balance winds up. I think mm -hmm. it, it's much better. Yeah, I, with the actions that we have taken are, um, I think, work. It looks like we're on track for a, um, uh, a tough year in food service. We yes, are. very tough. <coughs> However, um, maybe we can get some confirmation from. Yeah, I was actually I'm writing in the process of writing an article about the future of the food service for the Chronicle. So I've been talking to Brian a lot about specifically this issue, um, which is that basically not to like get into too many specifics because it gets kind of confusing. But um, the school gets federal reimbursement if students get a meal deal, which means they have to get a certain number of components and. Um, Historically, in the past couple of years, students haven't been doing those, which means that our food service is getting less reimbursement to cover their costs. And that's part of the issue of why the food service is struggling is mostly because of student choices. So in the past um, week before break, Brian actually um, set a requirement that when students purchase lunch, they have to get all the qualifying components, which means we're gonna get more reimbursement, which will hopefully get the food service a little bit more back on track financially. 
And this was part of our conversation too when we talked about the budget and one of the positions that we talked about reducing by was a food service position. Yeah. Um, so I, it, actually, I think leaving one unfilled is what it would amount to. Interesting. Um, yeah, I talked to Brian about like the implications of having one less food service member mm -hmm. and um, obviously like the food service could still function but there would be decreased um, options for students and like less choice around um, specifically breakfast he mentioned if one position was cut in order to satisfy the budget. Okay, we should have Lucy on the finance committee too. <laughs> <laughs> um, this may not be an absolutely reliable indicator but um, the, uh, the backseat conversations that I'm privy to as chauffeur um, <coughs> suggest that um, actually more positive response to what's going on in the kitchen these days. Yeah. That lunches are getting good. <laughs> so um, it, hopefully that is maybe a leading indicator. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> Anecdotal, but anecdotal. But, yeah. I, I can testify to that. After break, actually, with the reduction in plastic, students have more choice about what they eat. Like in the past, we had like these pre-made salads that the cafeteria made in plastic containers. But now, you like go into the line, you fill out this sheet about like everything you want. It's basically like going to a restaurant, like a oh. salad bar type situation. So I would agree with that anecdote. Mm. <laughs> Anything else on finance? And policy, remind me who there are. You a policy? Yeah, but I haven't been to a meeting. I don't know that we've had a meeting in a while. It hasn't been a meeting since January or, or December. The district wide policy is supervisory wide policy. Okay. Uh, we took care of the action agenda. Approved board or orders. Carl, you want to do that? Oh, let's see. We've got two of them here. One comes first, 21. 27 to 220. 102,228 dollars and 19 cents. You're moving. So I'm moving that. that. And I'll second. Scott, any questions? Comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes. And then I would move check warrant uh, for February 21st to March 6th for $101,786.80. And I'll second. I'll second. Any questions or comments about those? <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Okay, so that passes. All right, future agenda items. Yes. Can I make a mention of something else? I said that can be do with Berlitz Harlem. I don't, I don't <laughs> think you can make a motion, but, it's, it's, <laughs> but I, there was something else that I lost track of because I was so wrapped up about our board issue. Um, I love reading the Chronicle online; it's very handy. But I was really taken aback recently. I read an article where a librarian here was quoted as saying to the effect that three quarters of the space, the part filled with the books, was wasted space, and that they'd rather see it used for other types of learning, like adults coming in and working with kids, sewing machines, I forget what else was used, and I was just wondering if that's something that's been discussed here, or if there's talk about it, because there's nothing like sitting down on a couch with a Harry Potter book and the very thought of there not being books <laughs> just made me gasp. <laughs> I was out in public reading this article on my phone, <laughs> and people around me just kind of looked at me because I was like, what? <laughs> uh, I didn't see that one. I, 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 have, I, didn't I have the article pulled up now, and that is an accurate um, quotation. I also yeah. did not see that, but I find that pretty um, surprising. But it does echo that there have been a lot of changes with our library recently. Um, because we have, we did get a new librarian last year, and some of the changes have been positive, like there have been um, measures taken, so that's a more quiet learning space, like for homework and stuff, but that is an alarming quotation about wasted space 
What is it? It's a space with books in it. I don't It is. I'm a U32 graduate. graduate. I have fond memories yeah. of the library here. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll tell you, the rumors around my house about the library in the last few weeks have been about the fact that it's been too busy and they're needing to cut off the number of people coming in until somebody comes out. Yeah. So if you and your five friends show up to go, to, to go hang out in the library, only two or three of you might be able to get in and the others are stuck hanging out in the atrium. <laughs> so na nationally, the trend around libraries is that they're trying to make them more inviting spaces for a variety of learning, that they're not just a repository for books. Um, and so I think that what you hear in that quote is some of that process. So, um, so the broader piece here is that our design class has been working with the library so that our Woods 2 class can help build some new structures for the library so that we can create a more usable space. And I think that it's not an issue of eliminating all of those books, but we, we have um, half-shelf book, and that is space that really, right, right do we create a, an area where there's full shelves, full shelves um, right. and, and, and shrink down the space that the books take up, um, but not a wholesale Dismissal of three quarters. I don't think anything that quote books. said get rid of the books. Yeah, it's it's more of an issue. Did you read the article? She hasn't I read there. It says no, but did you read the article? No, I didn't. But I'm reading the article before you say that it's not really what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, is that your ter interpretation? Well, the quote you're referencing it says, and if you look here, Jill said pointing out a map where all of the books are. This is about three quarters of our space that is wasted. She explained that the library where all of the books are is space that could be used for other activities for learning. Right. This isn't saying throw out, let's go burn all the books. Yeah. Make them vertical. I mean, yeah. I know yeah. most kid libraries, and the high school shouldn't be like an elementary school library, the bookshelves are like this. And if I'm laying out my house or my library, I'm going to go to the ceiling. These kids are tall. You know, you could consolidate and then have more space for kids to spread out and learn and do different things. So, um, but is that the purview of this board to dictate what we do in the library? <laughs> I think that it's good to know what our library is doing. I think that um, like it would be better for us to have the design class to come talk to you guys about some of the ideas that, that they've been uh, posed because they are trying to create more usable space for students in the library because our library does get packed with yeah. kids. I mean, yeah. it's... Well, and it goes to... So when you do a redesign of like a major office space, mm -hmm. um, the way people work now is different. Yes. So they don't do cubicles. They do work pods, and they have spaces where they can get together and do different kinds of group and individual learning. So it's thinking about all of those things, too. Well, we brought in some, I don't know if you've used the tables in the back. Um, we have these, what are called collaborative tables, where the students can work around those with their computers, and there's a monitor that each one can share on. Um, and those, so those are some new pieces of furniture. So the old idea was that you had a, a computer lab in a library, right? So that we just had all these individual workstations. Now we have this collab table where kids actually work around with each other because they have laptops and do that. And so, so those are some of the design changes that we had. Um, I know that on a regular basis, our our um, our librarians will go through the books, and books that have not been checked out in a considerable amount of time are usually pulled from the shelves. But we also get new books in. I mean, that's. You know, at yeah. request, and so so we actually have a rotation of books that are coming through the library. And I, I would like to speak that one of the I'll call it one of the hazards of my job, my day job, is that I'm the funnel through which all the books out of all the libraries and schools in Central Vermont get get disposed of. I'm the one who takes them to recycling or reuse, and so I'm the filter for <laughs> for what I see what everybody's getting rid of. And the truth is, U32's discards are just about the least interesting in all of central Vermont. <laughs> in other words, we're holding yeah, on to the good, good stuff, yeah. and other libraries are turning over, you know. I, I, I'm not worried about the quality of the books in our library, given what I've seen coming out of our library. And they're making good choices when they call. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But, but um, I will try to get our couple of our design kids to come in and talk to you about what that project is, because. It's it's really great to see what they're trying to create for the. I think, I think the posters in the library show really and really explain oh. what they're trying to create. Yeah, yeah, I think they do a great job. We should get in there and see. Maybe we'll hold a meeting there. There you go. That's good.
Okay, back to future agenda items. So, by my tally, we have a meeting on the 20th that will be the reorganization. And can we keep talk about the track? Track, right? yep. Yep. Then on April 3rd, I expect we'll have our regular first, first Wednesday of the month. Um, and that would be the hearing on the budget. Yes, I, if you don't mind, uh, we just would do that first since we'll say yeah. 6 o'clock on there and yeah. have that first and then go I've never actually room. attended one of those. Is that is <laughs> a presentation or it just depends on who shows up? So there were three of us um, at the last meeting. So it was Scott, um, Adrian, and myself. Um, last year it was Adrian and myself and Karen. Okay. And the <laughs> year before that was Adrian, myself, and Emily. Um, well, wow. yet, um, and the year prior to that, we actually had somebody stop by for five minutes mm -hmm. to ask a couple of questions. All right, so it's unlikely we'll get much. Better. So, so it's it's a time where people can ask questions about our budget. It's um, it's been sparsely attended yeah. over the past five years that I've been here. But who knows? This yeah. could be the year. This could be the year. <laughs> and, and if um, it's not just the budget hearing on the third, it's also a regular interview. Regular, regular, yeah. So maybe we'll, maybe that will attract some, a couple of you know, a couple of, of onlookers. More than, more than two? <laughs> I don't know. Well, quality is more important than yes. quantity anyway. So um, potential topics for that meeting. I think we had a nice discussion about proficiencies. I, that, was, that was good. I really wanted to hear more. I'm, I'm actually wondering if we want to hear even more. And the reason I'm saying that is because I'm starting to hear more concerns from the community about, you know, just people I know about, you know, what's up with this proficiency stuff? And and I think the more fluent we are in the topic, the better we can I mean, the more help. proficient we are? What, I'm sorry? The more proficient we are? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, getting a little bit more into the weeds, um, understanding what the the challenges are so we can be honest about that when people ask us getting getting more student perspective maybe teacher perspective mm -hmm. yeah, what do people think about that yeah I agree sure. I, I've heard a little bit too and uh, I've kind of pushed pushed them back on Stephen saying you know what, what contact have you had with Stephen yeah. in, in the school yeah. and teachers about the proficiency and it, it just keeps coming back there's not enough information um, and we don't like proficiency and there has been a fair amount of information, but I think when you have that chance for a one-on-one -on -one and, yeah. and say a few things and I'd like to be intelligible, yeah. it's an opportunity. Yeah. So would that be fair? Yeah. I agree. Sure. Set that up for yeah. April 3rd? Yeah. That's April 3rd. Yeah, that's what I wrote down here was April 3rd. Thank you. And track and uh, the reorg for the 20th of March. Great. Great. And I know Lisa. Lisa's got it all over there, too. Anything else on the future agenda? Uh, in terms of the rest of the calendar, do we have a... So I'm going to uh, there's a Washington Central Supervisory Union reorganization meeting on the 27th. Okay. You and I. No, so not, not a carousel. Day. <laughs> That's a, right. Not a carousel? It's not a, it, if people want to have a board meeting, they could, but usually it's just that. Hmm. Um, we tried a carousel one, mark, one time a couple of years ago where everyone reorged that same night and just, in fact, it wasn't. Wasn't yeah, sufficient. Yeah. Remember, yeah. part of the reorg is uh, setting your meeting dates. Yeah, is, and all that. Is, okay. Is and, that and final I, part of And it. as I said at the beginning, we were getting some new dates because of the new district meeting. I will send out another calendar, probably version three now, of possible dates through the rest of the spring. Okay. Realizing that, and I hope you guys will all help me communicate those. When I put those out, they're not speaking for people that have authority to say it is. I'm just trying to put it on a calendar so people can kind of understand the layout. Sometimes people get confused that I'm trying to set them, and I'm not. I'm just trying to say this is how this could all work. <laughs> we can fit everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's all I had on that topic. Good. So board communication. <laughs> um, I can try it again. Um, Maybe more timely this time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we got a little more time to work with. Um, <clears throat> essentially, we want to get the word out that we're more warning about. Mm -hmm. Help people understand that while we are, we do want people to vote for this budget. They may and probably will be asked to vote on a unified budget. 
at a later date. At a later date. Yeah. But the reason we're doing this is to, you know, to have some, yeah. ensure that we have we support the, the school and the exactly. Exactly. no matter what the scenario is. So, okay. So you want to take a crack at that? Sure. All right. And uh, we'll work together on getting that out of you. Okay. Any other business? So we're adjourned at 7.16. Thank you. Thank you.